In North Carolina, a Marine's estranged wife disappears without a trace. With no body and little physical evidence, naval investigators struggle to determine her fate. The remains of a young woman are found burning near a rural South Carolina road. For five years, her identity and that of her killer remain a mystery. In Virginia, a sailor in the United States Navy is found murdered in a vacant lot. Investigators must look among his shipmates to find the killer. Violence is an inescapable reality of contemporary life. And Navy sailors and U.S. Marines are not beyond its reach. When those who defend their country commit murder, it falls to special agents of the Naval Criminal Investigative Service to ensure that no one escapes military justice. Camp Lejeune is one of America's largest training grounds for the U.S. Marine Corps. But even here, where honor and loyalty are virtues, betrayal and murder exist. On March 27, 1999, Marine Corps Sergeant Whitman Wallace reported his estranged wife, 25-year-old Tanya, missing to military police. Though he and Tanya were separated, their four-year-old daughter had been staying with him for a few days. Tanya was supposed to pick her up after she got off work the previous evening. But she never showed. Tanya's roommates hadn't seen her either, and they said that her vehicle was also missing. Whitman believed Tanya had run off with another man. The case was turned over to the Naval Criminal Investigative Service, or NCIS, an elite civilian federal law enforcement organization whose mission is to protect and serve the Navy and Marine Corps and their families. Special Agent Robert Bratton, who headed up the major case response team, began the investigation into Tanya Wallace's disappearance. There were some very real concerns about uh, a mother of a four-year-old child who was very close to her child leaving uh, without any uh, comment to the family that she was staying with at the time. A few hours after the missing persons report was filed, word came in that Tanya's abandoned car had been found. Security guards at a nearby store had noticed it sitting in the parking lot since early that morning. An examination of the vehicle's exterior revealed the presence of small traces of human blood on the door handle. Agents and military police quickly spread out and began scouring the area for any signs of the young mother. But hours of searching failed to produce any clues to the missing woman's whereabouts. The vehicle was impounded for a more detailed analysis. Agents had to consider that with an impending divorce, Tanya Wallace might have gone missing on purpose. Looking for answers, agents went to check out her apartment and interview her roommates. One confirmed that recently Tanya had begun dating another man, but he was in the Navy and was currently deployed overseas. Tanya had made no mention of plans to travel. And since ending her relationship with the abusive Whitman Wallace, nothing seemed to be troubling her. The roommate added that since her split with Wallace, Tanya had become upbeat and excited about the new life she had ahead of her. 
she was committed to her daughter's happiness. And her roommate could not believe that Tanya would simply abandon her four-year-old, leaving her estranged husband to raise her. Based on interviews of her girlfriend that she was living with, uh, the fact that she had never uh, left the child alone for any period of time, in fact, was uncomfortable leaving uh, her child with uh, the father for any extended periods of time. Uh, we relatively quickly ruled out the, the idea that she had probably left with somebody willingly. Before leaving, agents collected Tanya's toothbrush and a hairbrush for future DNA comparisons. Though agents remained hopeful that Tanya Wallace would turn up unharmed, all the signs were pointing to foul play. But so far, they had no physical proof that a crime had taken place. Okay. Right, I appreciate you coming down and talk to me. No Sergeant Got Whitman Wallace for was brought in for questioning. He insisted he had nothing to do with Tanya's disappearance. Though they couldn't seem to make their marriage work, he still loved her and their four-year-old daughter. He said that on the night Tanya disappeared, he had been assigned to work desk duty from 11 p.m. until early the next morning. He said he never left his post. Agents contacted Wallace's assistant, who also worked that evening. He confirmed that Wallace began his shift at 11 o'clock. But 30 minutes later, Wallace asked him to watch his desk. Wallace said his wife hadn't shown up to pick up their daughter, and he needed to go back home and look after her until Tanya arrived. Wallace left and eventually returned two hours later. Agents realized that Sergeant Wallace had lied when he claimed he never left work that night. Now, they needed to find out what he was trying to hide. They turned to the only piece of physical evidence they had. A week after she was reported missing, NCIS Special Agent and Forensic Consultant Mike Maloney began examining Tanya's vehicle. As soon as we opened the door, it was obvious that there was a great deal of blood in the car. It couldn't be seen from the outside. The interior of the vehicle was, or, was very dark, uh, dark colored carpet, dark colored uh, seats and interior. But once we opened the door, it was apparent that there was blood. The carpet revealed a large blood stain, approximately 16 inches long and 13 inches wide. Examiners removed it for a more detailed analysis. The DNA profile of the blood found in the vehicle matched those generated from the samples collected from Tanya's residence. Hey, Bob. It was clear that something violent had happened to Tanya. But without a body, agents were unable to prove that she was dead. Special Agent Mike Maloney devised a blood volume analysis experiment that could provide them with that proof. We felt that we could show that she had lost so much blood in that vehicle that she couldn't possibly be alive. Agent Maloney first needed to determine how much blood it would take to create the same size stains as those left on the vehicle's carpet. They obtained carpet samples from the vehicle manufacturer and saturated them with human blood. Examiners determined that 1,850 milliliters of human blood or nearly four pints was necessary to create a similar size stain. And that would be nearly half of Tanya Wallace's total blood volume. No one could have survived such severe bleeding without medical assistance. For agents, there was now no doubt that Tanya Wallace was dead. And they were equally convinced that her estranged husband 
Sergeant Whitman Wallace was responsible. But so far, they had no hard evidence to prove murder. With no body and only a blood-stained carpet to work with, forensic examiners of the Naval Criminal Investigative Service proved that missing 25-year-old Tanya Wallace was dead. And NCIS special agents believed her estranged husband, Marine Corps Sergeant Whitman Wallace, had killed her. But they lacked physical proof. And Wallace was no longer cooperating. Believing the suspect may have tried to throw away evidence of his guilt, agents began searching the dumpsters surrounding Wallace's barracks. But the trash had already been emptied. NCIS Special Agent Robert Bratton refused to give up. Though it seemed like a long shot, he contacted the area landfill where all of the trash from the Camp Lejeune dumpsters is brought. They can tell you where trash that's picked up and delivered that day or any particular day is within just a few feet. We asked them at that point to isolate the uh, trash that was delivered on Monday and Tuesday of that week. The Marines Chemical Biological Incidents Response Force located that spot and began sifting through the mountain of debris. After hours of searching, the team found and collected a large green military issue sweatshirt and some women's clothes. All of the items were covered with what appeared to be blood stains. DNA tests on the items of clothing showed that all of the blood had originated from Tanya Wallace. And for Special Agent Mike Maloney, it appeared that Tanya had been wearing the clothing at the time of her death, except for one item, the green sweatshirt. We were curious as to who the sweatshirt belonged to, though. The staining was on the outside of the sweatshirt and saturated to the inside, so we were fairly certain it wasn't something that Tanya was wearing the night that she was killed. We examined the neckband of the sweatshirt and also the armpits. And there was quite a bit of uh, debris, of uh, old skin cells, of sweat and sweat saturation. Examiners were able to extract minute traces of DNA from the skin cells found on the sweatshirt. Analysis showed that the DNA was consistent with having come from Sergeant Whitman Wallace. Believing they were closing in on Tanya's killer, agents searched Wallace's barracks room. Wallace was in the process of moving out, and the place had been thoroughly cleaned. Uh, I don't know what they'll turn out to be. When agents applied luminol and darkened the room, large stains emerged on the tile floor. Got it? Yeah. Tests confirmed that the blood was human. But the stain stopped abruptly where the carpet began. No blood was present beyond the tile flooring. Convinced Tanya had been murdered inside Whitman Wallace's barracks room, agents began interviewing other Marines who lived in the same complex. What do you have for him? One Marine recalled that a few days after Tanya was reported missing, Wallace paid him a visit. And, uh, it's, probably, it's probably no big deal. Appreciate it, man. You want to much appreciate he said that he had an inspection coming up, and the carpet in his room was muddy, and it would never pass. Wallace asked to switch the carpets, and the barracks maid agreed. But after the inspection was complete, Wallace never returned to switch the rugs back. I'll give you a call, all right? All right, later on, okay. In fact, it was still lying on the Marine's floor. You have his rug now? Yeah. Hoping the rug contained the evidence they needed to prove Whitman Wallace was a killer, agents collected it and brought it to the lab for testing. 
good. Got it? Agent Maloney examined the carpet. We did the luminol test, and we found the rest of the missing pattern from that stain by the door. They matched together perfectly, just like a puzzle piece, a very large saturation stain of what was later positively identified as blood on the carpet that matched that pattern that had been so sharply cut off on the tile floor. DNA testing revealed that the blood on the rug, as well as the blood on the tile floor, was consistent with Tanya's. Agents now had enough evidence to make their case. Sergeant Whitman Wallace was placed under arrest and charged with murder. Based on the evidence, agents believed that Whitman Wallace was unwilling to give up custody of his daughter and was resentful of having to pay child support. On March 26, 1999, after getting off work, Tanya went to her estranged husband's barracks to pick up her daughter. Whitman Wallace had made sure he would be there when she arrived. With the couple's four-year-old daughter asleep in the next room, Wallace savagely beat Tanya to death. He put her bleeding body into her vehicle, drove to a remote site, and buried her. At a general court-martial, Sergeant Whitman Wallace pled guilty to kidnapping and unpremeditated murder. He was sentenced to 30 years in prison. And as part of the plea agreement, Wallace led authorities to Tanya's remains. Even without the victim's body, NCIS special agents were able to quickly expose the deadly violence of a Marine Corps sergeant. But in South Carolina, it would take naval investigators years to unravel one killer's deadly scheme. On November 6th, 1989, a man driving along an isolated road in Jasper County, South Carolina, noticed something burning on the side of the road. Fearing it could spark a larger fire, he went to extinguish it. The fire was emanating from a large green duffel bag. And inside the bag, the man saw what appeared to be the charred remains of a human body. He called 911. Deputies from the Jasper County Sheriff's Office raced to the scene. The person found inside the duffel bag was burned beyond recognition. And the skull had been smashed. The only clue to the victim's identity was a unicorn print nightgown that had survived the blaze, indicating this person was likely female. According to Jasper County Detective Sam Woodward, investigators found little else. The only thing we had was a, a female body in a duffel bag that was set afire. Um, basically, that's all we had. We didn't have no footprints, uh, no tire tracks, nothing like that. Believing that the victim's identity would reveal her killer, police hoped an autopsy would yield valuable information. The weight, 165, Analysis of the remains led the medical examiner to conclude that the female victim was Caucasian, around 25 years old, with dark brown hair. An enlarged uterus indicated that she had recently given birth. Her death had been brutal. She had been hit in the head 32 times with a blunt instrument. Police entered what little information they had into a national law enforcement database containing descriptions of missing persons. They also checked all local missing persons reports. But none of the reports matched the description of this Jane Doe. Authorities knew their only hope of identifying this victim was to reconstruct her face as it had been in life. For help, 
police called upon the expertise of Dr. Ted Rathbun, professor of anthropology at the University of South Carolina. He quickly realized this task would not be easy. In a complete human skull, there are 22 separate bones of the skull and face. But in this instance, due to the massive trauma, there were at least 122 fragments to deal with. Some as large as the palm of your hand, others as small as half of your little fingernail. So that it really was a jigsaw puzzle, a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. After eight days, Dr. Rathbun had successfully rebuilt the skull. I was able to provide law enforcement and the forensic artists with a completed skull that was held together with glue, with uh, supporting sticks and clay, uh, so that photographs could be taken and oriented, uh, representing an individual with a distinctive facial structure. Okay. Forensic artist Roy Pascal of the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division was brought in. It was now up to him to bring this victim to life. Uh, we do get that high breathe. After placing rubber markers at certain points in the skull to indicate the depth of the flesh, Pascal photographed the evidence. Then he began drawing the face of the victim by hand in pencil. Four months after her body was found, Jane Doe finally had a face. Hoping to spark some recognition from the public, the victim's image was distributed throughout the area to the media and to local law enforcement agencies. But no leads were developed. Five years went by without a break in the investigation. It began to look as if this case would never be solved. For investigators, it seemed that the identity of Jane Doe and that of her killer would remain a mystery. For nearly five years, a female victim found burning along a Jasper County, South Carolina road remained unidentified. Although forensic examiners had given Jane Doe a face, her name and the circumstances surrounding her death remained a mystery. Yeah, well, one time. Years of searching through missing persons reports failed to produce a match. And by 1993, missing persons cases filed in South Carolina had reached an all-time high. But the rash of reported cases was not limited to the civilian population. Agents from the Naval Criminal Investigative Service stationed in Charleston were also inundated with similar cases involving military personnel and members of their families. Though they had formed a cold case squad to deal with the volume, their caseload continued to increase. In October of 1993, agents responded to the home of Kathy French. Her lifelong friend, 28-year-old Annie Tahan, hadn't been heard from in nearly five years. At the time of her disappearance, Annie had been living with her boyfriend, Michael Pallon, a sailor stationed in Charleston. And though Annie and Michael had had a child together in 1989, their relationship had been troubled. Just after Annie became pregnant, Michael grew violent and abusive toward her. He would explode into a rage for no particular reason and threaten to leave her and take their baby with him. Annie began to fear for her life, but she vowed she would never give up her child. A short while later, Kathy moved out of state. And after giving birth to her baby, Annie wanted to join her 
but was reluctant because Michael Pallan had had her arrested once before on bogus kidnapping charges. A few months later, Annie called her. She was ready to leave Charleston with her baby and come stay with Kathy. Kathy said she wired Annie money for bus fare, but never heard from her again. Since the father of the missing woman's child was a sailor in the United States Navy, NCIS Special Agent Jim Grebus agreed to open an investigation. But given the couple's tumultuous relationship, he had to consider that Annie's disappearance had been intentional. Uh, we felt that maybe she um, was in a bad relationship with Michael Pallon and that she could have just fled, and um, that, that was a possibility we had to rule out. A records check showed that Electronics Warfare okay, Chief guys, Michael Pallon was currently stationed at a naval base in Hawaii. Agent Grebus contacted agents there and asked them to speak with Pallon. Chief Pallon. Michael Pallon told the agents that on the morning of November 6, 1989, he woke to find that Annie had left him and the baby. He remembered that she'd called a few days later, but didn't say where she was or what her plans were. He hadn't heard from her since. Pallon added that his mother, who currently lived in Savannah, Georgia, had since adopted their daughter. Naval investigators didn't believe Pallon's story. For them, there was only one explanation as to why Annie Tahan was not with her baby. We felt that if she was going to leave, what she wanted to do, she would have taken that child. That was the one thing she wanted was to take that child with her. She did not want to lose that child. It didn't take uh, us very long to form the opinion that she had, uh, she had been um, murdered. Agents believe that Michael Pallan had killed Annie Tahan. But so far, they had no proof. They began reviewing dozens of unsolved murder cases from throughout the state. In one of the files, dating back to 1989, Agent Grievous made a startling discovery. That was a forensic a drawing of a young lady that had been found in Jasper County on November 6th of 1989. And I took this photograph I had of Annie, and I, I looked at both of them, and I knew right then that this was Annie and that we had just found her. DNA analysis confirmed that the mysterious Jane Doe was, in fact, Annie Tahan. And now, Naval Chief Michael Pallan was the prime suspect in her murder investigation. Well, I went up to sled yesterday and I met with but NCIS Special Agent Peter Hughes knew that finding proof of his guilt would be difficult. The problem we were confronted with was the fact that we were working a homicide case six years after the fact. So to um, start from ground zero and try and put these facts together was going to be a tremendous hurdle for all of us. The results for the credit card. Agents and local authorities began by trying to retrace Pallan's movements at the time of the murder. In Hardyville. They sifted through his phone records for November 6, 1989. They found several calls placed to a number in Savannah, Georgia, located a hundred miles away. The number belonged to Pallan's ex-wife. Unsure of the connection, local police obtained her financial records. They found a receipt dated November 6th from a gas station located 25 miles from where Annie's body was discovered. Investigators began to theorize that Michael Pallan had not acted alone. Agents traveled to Miami, where Pallan's ex-wife currently lived. Though she denied any knowledge of Annie's murder, she remembered that one morning in mid-November 1989, Pallan called her. He said that Annie had recently left him and he needed her to help take care of the baby. She agreed and drove to Pallan's apartment in Charleston a day or two later to pick up the child. 
but the phone records and gas receipts proved that she had traveled to the apartment on November 6th, the same day Annie was murdered. When it came to dates and times, she couldn't seem to keep her story straight. Agents confronted her with the receipts and asked if they would help refresh her memory. Once she realized we knew she was in that apartment uh, at about the time that, that Annie was murdered, um, she knew we had her. Knowing she could be implicated in the murder, the ex-wife agreed to cooperate. She said that Michael Pallan didn't want Annie in his life anymore, but wanted the couple's baby. Knowing Annie would never give up her child, Pallan plotted to kill her. And the ex-wife agreed to help him pull it off. In the early morning hours of November 6th, Pallan called her and told her it was done and he needed her help in cleaning up the apartment. When she arrived just after dawn, she noticed blood everywhere. After helping Palan load Annie's body into the trunk of his car, she helped him shampoo the carpets and paint over the blood spatter on the walls. The information had brought agents one step closer to making their case. Now they needed to find physical proof that Michael Pallan had done what his ex-wife had accused him of. She agreed to take agents to Pallan's old apartment and walk them through the crime scene. Though the apartment was now vacant, the ex-wife was able to point out where Annie's body had been on the carpet. She also described the pattern of blood spatter on the walls and ceiling. But no blood was visible. And after so many years, agents were skeptical they would find any. Still, agents darkened the room and applied luminol throughout the area. To their surprise, blood was still present and the locations of all the stains were exactly where the ex-wife said they would be. Though the findings had corroborated the ex-wife's statements and provided powerful evidence of Pallan's guilt, agents knew it didn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he was the killer. Because when you look at the facts of the case, a defense attorney can easily say that this was a jealous wife who killed her, not Pallon, but a jealous wife. Agents needed to get Michael Pallon to confess to the murder. With the ex-wife's help, agents set a trap. She would phone Pallon and coax him into talking about the murders. Interesting enough, the opening comment that his ex-wife made was, uh, Michael, they found the body. They found Annie. And his reply was, no, they didn't, which um, was, was a major significance in that he, an innocent person, of course, is going to say, what are you talking about, body? I don't know what, what are you talking about? But now he's, he's on the phone and he's telling us, no, the police didn't find the body. Got him to talk about after several days of intercepting phone calls, agents had heard enough. Well, did you hear him deny? Tell him. Three weeks before he was scheduled to retire from the Navy, Chief Michael Pallan was placed under arrest and charged with the murder of Annie Tahan. Confronted with the evidence amassed against him, Pallan confessed to the crime. Determined to keep his child, he said in the early morning hours of November 6th, he returned home from work to find Annie sleeping in front of the TV. Using a blunt instrument, he beat her to death. To conceal his guilt, he placed Annie's body in a duffel bag and drove to a deserted country road. 
he threw gasoline on the body and lit it on fire. At a general court-martial convened at the Naval Station in Mayport, Florida, Michael Pallan pled guilty to the premeditated murder of Annie Tahan. He was sentenced to 30 years at the Leavenworth Federal Prison. We asked for comparisons. Betrayal by a husband or a wife has become all too common. This, this is our girl, or somewhere along the way. But military buddies claim to be loyal friends to the end. Much in the eyes. On the morning of April 23, 1998, a man pulling up weeds near an apartment complex in Newport News, Virginia, noticed something lying in the grass. When he approached, he saw that it was a human body, and the male victim had been shot to death. The man went to a nearby apartment and called 911. Officers from the Newport News Police Department responded to the scene. They began searching the victim's pockets for any clues to his identity. Inside a wallet, they found several hundred dollars in cash and an ID card. The victim was 23-year-old Stephen November a sailor stationed aboard an aircraft carrier at the nearby Norfolk Naval Base. He had been shot five times. But the lack of any stray bullets or shell casings at the scene, combined with scuff marks observed on the victim's shoes, led police to believe that Stephen November had been murdered elsewhere, then brought to this remote location. No one who lived in the area had seen or heard anything unusual. At autopsy, the medical examiner determined that the cause of death was a 9mm gunshot wound to the victim's head. Four other bullets, recovered from November's head and chest, appeared to have been fired from the same weapon. But with few clues and no solid suspects, police knew that finding this young sailor's killer would be a difficult challenge. Police in Newport News, Virginia, continued searching for answers in the shooting death of 23-year-old Stephen November, an enlisted sailor in the United States Navy. With little physical evidence to go on, Police hoped a search of his residence would yield some clues. Police scoured November's records. One document caught their attention. It was a transaction record in Stephen November's name for a 9mm handgun, the same type of gun that had been used to kill him. But a thorough search of the apartment failed to produce the weapon. Looking to uncover any information, detectives contacted the victim's commanding officers at the Norfolk Naval Base. But nothing in November's record suggested any problems. He was a dedicated sailor and was well liked by his shipmates. Hoping to retrace November's movements on the night he was murdered, detectives arranged to interview his friends and shipmates. Airman apprentice Hector Coleman said he and another friend were with November the night before his body was discovered. The three had gone out to run a few errands that evening. Around 10 o'clock, November asked the driver, Carlos Saldana, to drop him off at a nearby convenience store. November said he had some things to do, and he would meet up with them later. He had just cashed a large tax refund check and was carrying over $2,000 in cash. The 
two men watched November enter the store and then drove away. It's a cool guy. I mean, cool guy. Coleman said they never saw their friend after that. Airman recruit Carlos Saldana, who had been driving the car that night, was also interviewed. He told the same story as Hector Coleman. But almost immediately, police sensed that Saldana was not telling the truth. Newport News homicide detective Lorenzo Shepard observed the questioning. Uh, while he was being questioned, he was, appeared to be very nervous. Uh, he was very fidgety. Uh, he wouldn't look you directly in the eye. And those normally are, sound, are signs of individuals who are being deceptive or not being truthful uh, when discussing something. Sure. Detectives asked Saldana to take a polygraph test. When the results indicated deception, he decided to talk. Saldana said the three had gone to the convenience store that night, but they did not leave after November went inside. The victim got into the back seat of the car a few minutes later, and they drove away. He said Hector Coleman then pulled out a 9mm gun and shot Stephen November. The motive behind the murder, according to Saldana, was robbery. Saldana had no idea where the murder weapon currently was, but he knew that the gun belonged to Stephen November. Carlos Saldana and Hector Coleman were both placed under arrest and charged with murder. Coleman denied any involvement in the shooting. With Saldana's confession, police believed they had an airtight case. But a month before the case was scheduled to go to trial, an inmate serving time with Saldana in the city jail came forward with information. I've already been here for three months. I don't, uh, everybody. Carlos Saldana had bragged that he was the one who actually murdered Stephen November. He told the inmate that he had pinned it on Hector Coleman in order to avoid the death penalty. The inmate had provided reliable information in the past, and police had no reason to doubt him now. Investigators' strongest witness had confessed to being the trigger man. And now, a month before the trial, they were back to square one. Investigators knew that one of the two men in custody was responsible for Stephen November's murder. But until they could prove who had pulled the trigger, they knew they could never win a conviction. Police in Newport News, Virginia, had two enlisted men in custody for the murder of Stephen November, a 23-year-old Navy sailor found shot to death in a vacant lot. Though Carlos Saldana told police that his friend Hector Coleman was the killer, Saldana later admitted to an inmate that he had actually pulled the trigger. With the trial just weeks away, investigators were now in danger of losing their case. But they had another option, one that would allow investigators more time to build a solid case. Newport News authorities dropped all of the charges against Hector Coleman and Carlos Saldana and turned the case over to prosecutors of the Navy's Judge Advocate General Corps, referred to as JAG, who shared jurisdiction in the investigation. JAG officer Lieutenant Commander Scott Lang took the case. And with little physical evidence, he had to prove which of the two witnesses was telling the truth. The challenges in this case were that we had only two witnesses, and both of them had a huge motive to lie. Uh, no one wants to get pinned with being the actual trigger man in a murder. So we did not want to commit our prosecutorial efforts to any one theory uh, based solely on the word of someone with a motive to lie. For help, Lieutenant Commander Lang turned to special agents of the Naval Criminal Investigative Service located in Norfolk, Virginia. Well, I just want to go Give everybody a brief here. Agent Bill Heath was assigned the case. 
His first step was to determine the truthfulness of Carlos Saldana's claim that Hector Coleman committed the murder inside his vehicle. We wanted to go back to that vehicle and determine the feasibility of Mr. Saldana's statement. Could this shooting have occurred in this vehicle as he described? That was, that was their primary objective. Is it possible? An initial inspection of the vehicle, however, revealed no visible traces of blood or any other signs of violence. The search of Saldana's vehicle was turning up nothing. And it seemed that agent's best chance of exposing Stephen November's killer was slipping away. But NCIS forensic examiners are trained to look past the obvious. Special Agent Mike Maloney removed the rear seat of the vehicle where Stephen November had allegedly been sitting when the murder occurred. When he split the seat cushions open, he found the underlying foam cushion soaked in blood. DNA analysis confirmed that the blood stains had come from Stephen November's body. Using a projectile trajectory analysis, Agent Maloney now set out to prove where the shots had come from. Projectile trajectory analysis is a method by which you take the injuries or the wounds that occur to the individual and also any intermediate targets that the bullet may have passed through, be it the clothing, be it the seat itself, um, a wall, a window, and by lining those up you're able to determine where the likely point of origin of that shot was. A mannequin with Stephen November's bullet-ridden shirt was placed in the back seat of Saldana's car. Using the blood stains in the seat cushion to approximate the victim's position, Agent Maloney concluded that the path of the bullets must have originated from the front passenger seat. Since Carlos Saldana was known to be the driver the night of the murder, agents could assume that Hector Coleman had occupied the front passenger seat position. But for Special Agent Heath, that was not enough. He needed to locate the murder weapon, which he believed was Stephen November's missing 9mm gun. A short while after entering the serial number into a national law enforcement database, he got a call. Police in Brooklyn, New York had arrested a man on a burglary charge, and in his possession was Stephen November's 9mm handgun. When the gun was recovered, I was uh, extremely happy that, that we had found that proverbial needle in a haystack. The next hurdle was determining, is this the murder weapon or not? After ballistics tests confirmed that November's gun had fired the fatal shots, Agent Heath traveled to New York to find out how the gun got there. The man in custody claimed he bought the gun from a friend of his. Reluctantly, he provided agents with the name and number of the seller. Agents contacted the man who had sold the gun. Fearing for his own safety, he agreed to talk but only in a secluded spot at a nearby park. When shown photographs of the suspects, he pointed to Hector Coleman, an old childhood friend, as the man who sold him the 9mm gun. Coleman told his friend that he had used the gun to commit a murder, and now he needed to get rid of it. Once I was able to locate the witness in New York that actually purchased this 9mm from Mr. Coleman, his testimony became absolutely tremendous because here we have a disinterested third party who, in a casual conversation with Mr. Coleman, was given all the details of the crime. Though agents have no idea why Carlos Saldana had bragged to an inmate that he had pulled the trigger, they had proven that Hector Coleman had murdered Stephen November. Agents believe that before entering the convenience store, November asked his friend Hector Coleman to hold on to his 9mm gun. After driving away, Coleman said he wanted to fire the gun into the air. He asked November to make sure there were no police around. 
when the young sailor turned his back, Coleman shot him. He then robbed him of nearly $2,000 in tax refund money. Then had Saldana drive to a remote location where they dumped the victim. Saldana later claimed that Coleman threatened to kill him too if he told anyone about the murder. Carlos Saldana pled guilty to one count of accessory and two counts of false official statements. He was sentenced to eight years confinement. A general court-martial was convened for Hector Coleman on August 18, 1999. He was found guilty of the robbery and murder of Stephen November. He was sentenced to life without parole in a federal prison. Violent crime poses a threat to every segment of society. But when a murder occurs within the United States Navy and Marine Corps, it falls to special agents of the Naval Criminal Investigative Service to make certain that no one escapes military justice. puzzle of life and death lies in pieces. It is a story written in the blood of young people defending a country, a cause, an ideal. Some lived to return safely home and some did not. Others disappeared. On a brisk autumn morning in upstate New York, the earth yields the victims of a savage world war waged more than 200 years ago. Half a world away, dense jungle guards secrets of soldiers gone, but not forgotten. Today, a new breed of forensic detectives pieces together their terrible final hours in ways never before possible. How these people lived and died is written in their bones. After long years of lying silent, they begin to tell these soldiers' stories. As the ancients have said, the war is not over as long as the last slain soldier remains unburied. Although the unknown soldiers that lie here are in fact buried, no families were ever notified, no loved ones ever appeared by the grave. Who these people were, the pain and fear they suffered, how they died, all these mysteries are sealed forever beneath impenetrable marble slabs. Today, thanks to modern science, no one in the United States military need ever again become an unknown. During Operation Desert Storm in 1990, for the first time in history, the identity of two servicemen was established by extracting DNA from their shattered remains and matching it against the DNA of living relatives, a costly and difficult process. Now, to more easily trace the names of war casualties, blood is taken at recruitment to predetermine each person's DNA pattern, as unique as their fingerprints. DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, is the blueprint of life. The chemical essence of genes, it exists in all cells of the body and carries the information for eye color, race, height, and other traits. Today, 
the technology to decipher DNA is so precise that recruits go off to war with a kind of genetic dog tag on file with the government. Hundreds of samples a year arrive at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology outside Washington, D.C. are you? The laboratory, which is the largest of its type in the world, processes and stores the genetic material. A computer checks name and social security number and prints labels for each packet. Maintained under tight security, the data may not be released except by court order. More than a million samples are already placed in deep freeze, each representing a unique human being. Deputy Program Manager is James Kanick. For those who have ever visited Arlington or any military cemetery, uh, probably one of the most moving things is to uh, see a grave that doesn't have a, no a name on it. And of course the inscription uh, reads, uh, here lies an honored glory, an American service member known but to God. And we hope that in our little operation that we have here, that we will preclude that from ever happening again. The first major war in which Americans fought and died was more than a decade before the War of Independence. The tranquil region, now known as Lake George, New York, was the scene of some of history's bloodiest fighting. In 1754, France and England clashed in a mighty struggle for control of North America. The brutal French and Indian War raged for nine years and spread to every country where Britain and France had territorial interests. called the first true world war. By 1763, with the French thoroughly defeated, the English ruled most of North America, including the 13 colonies. A strategic British outpost during the war was Fort William Henry. In the 1950s, the site was developed as a tourist attraction. Excavations of the old fort guided architects during reconstruction. While digging, scientists stumbled on an undisturbed burial ground. Today, a team of anthropologists and volunteers begin to piece together the story of how these soldiers lived and died. What they unearth is one of the most gruesome stories in the annals of war. Forensic anthropologist Mariah Liston first began working with the Fort William Henry burials in 1993. Her colleague, Brenda Baker, has worked with her since the beginning of the project. Liston and Baker know from patterns in the earth that they are guaranteed to find burials here. This is the outline of one of the rectangular grave shafts. It extends from that corner to the head would be right here. We can tell it's a grave shaft because the disturbed soil from digging this hole has been thrown back in and we get this mottled coloration that contrasts very strongly with the undisturbed sand in this area. Over the course of 10 days, mounting excitement is tempered by the patience and precision for which every anthropologist is trained. As they carefully remove the earth within the grave shafts, the top of a skull finally emerges. I think this is really one of the most exciting parts of this because this is the first time this person has been seen since he was laid to rest. And you get an idea as you uncover his face of something about what he looked like and, and who he was. Slowly, the extent of the find becomes evident. Remarkably, the skeleton seems intact. When we first discover something new, some specific bit of information we haven't had before, um, it's exciting to have another piece of the picture um, and to know that we're, we're filling out the puzzle a little bit more with each of these discoveries. So I often wonder what happened to their families. Did the families ever learn that these men had died or what they died from? Um, 
and who they left behind. Uh, many of them probably had wives and children um, in other places. They're all pretty young. They're as young as about 14 or 15 up to early 20s, most of them. Um, a few that are a little bit older, but they're, they're late teens and early 20s. Before the skeleton is removed for That's preservation right. and study, Liston carefully documents its exact position. Even now, she begins to recognize the telltale signs of a vicious war etched in these bones. It looks like this is one of the soldiers that has been doing a lot of really heavy labor. There's a lot of wear and tear on all of his joints. The muscles in his back had torn from the soldier's bones under the constant stress of carrying heavy loads, and his ribs became fused to the vertebrae. He must have been in constant pain. If left exposed to the elements, the bones would deteriorate over time. Working well into the night, the team removes and labels each bone fragment to take to the lab. I'm suspicious about this break in the back of the skull. It looks like something that may have happened while the bone was still fresh. It could easily be what killed it. His face is going to come away. As the fragile skull is pulled from the earth, the bones crumble. The skull apparently was crushed by the weight of the soil. What a shame. It's this bad fracture here on the bottom, too, that comes across and gets you know, that as well. But we may be able to see something a little bit more clearly when we get that all cleaned up. Two small buttons are found with the skeleton. They appear to be military, but the team can't be sure until they have been removed. One was found in the pelvic cavity of the skeleton, and the other seems to be attached to an unidentified material. And it looks like it's attached to either leather or it may very well be part of his skin. Copper often preserves organic tissue very well. American militia fought alongside the British at Fort William Henry. Items like buttons and fabric may provide clues to rank and nationality. Painstaking work, cleaning, sorting, and documenting the remains will take more than a dozen people weeks to complete. So this is probably where this other, this other button, these two were down, they dropped down into the pelvic cavity, and this one was right up on top of the hip socket. Some artifacts found with the bodies can be identified. Others remain a mystery. But many of the pieces in this detective story finally begin to take form. Far more than a pile of bones, a young soldier has emerged from the depths with a story he waited centuries to tell. So those two, those two pieces. Two weeks into the excavation, as winter closes in, one complete burial has been unearthed, and several others are still being excavated. The team's task now is to try to read the life history that is written in the bones. The first thing that we can do is take a look at the skull and some of the features on the skull that indicate he's a male. If you look at the area over his eye orbits, you see that it's fairly well developed, and there are brow ridges essentially there, and that's a feature that you find in men. Women's foreheads tend to be a little bit higher. This one slopes back a bit, so that's an indication that this is a man. This is his jaw, his lower jaw, and you can see it's very large and robust, and his chin is extremely square, and this is another feature of a male. Next, they must determine the person's age at death. And if you look at the ends of his bones and his arms and legs, you can see that they're completely fused together. In younger individuals, you would see separate caps at the ends of the bones, and because those caps have fused on, we know that he's at least more than about 18 years old. We can see that his molars are all completely erupted here, including his wisdom tooth, and that usually erupts when you're about 18 to 21 years old. So again, another indicator that he's an adult male. Many other questions remain. What was life at Fort William Henry like for this man? What was the condition of his health? Most of the younger individuals had very severe arthritis, 
The only place where he has any significant arthritis is here in his right elbow. And this is the forearm. Uh, this is the bone where it hooks over your upper arm and allows you to move it back and forth like that. And if you compare the right elbow to the left elbow, you can see how much rougher this surface is here on the right. So this means he had a lot more action in his right arm. And because of the arthritis showing up just in his right elbow, it suggests that he's a right-handed man. We have another clue that he was right-handed because he's got wear on some of his teeth on his lower jaw. And you can see it's beveled right on these cusp surfaces here. So he's probably clenching a pipe over on the, the left side of his jaw. And that's what would have caused that kind of strange wear pattern on his lower teeth. And because he was clenching that on the left side of his jaw, he was probably right-handed. You would put the pipe in the left side of your mouth and use your left hand to take the pipe in and out. The French and Indian War was fierce and long. Yet the soldier's most constant enemy was not a bullet, but disease. Smallpox, influenza, and tuberculosis ran rampant. This group of skeletons is more sickly um, in worse shape than anything I've ever worked with. Um, I've looked at people as old as about 3,000 years old and modern, more modern populations as well. And yet this is the most diseased group. They've got the most injuries. Um, all the way around, there's more pathology here than anything. Although more soldiers died from disease than war-related injuries, the battle picture that emerges becomes increasingly grim. This soldier is an example of one that was shot. There's this depression that caused the bone to be crushed here, and another one at the top of the bone here. You can actually see the rounded depression of the musket ball. A lot of the soldiers that we found died from blows to the head. Here, something struck the soldier and punctured the bone, forcing fragments inside the skull and also fracturing it here down toward his eye and also running back toward the back of the skull. Diaries reveal that as the French attacked Fort William Henry, the British simply surrendered, too sick with smallpox to fight back. Then, without warning, a group of Indians allied to the French attacked and slaughtered the ill and injured men. The event was central to the novel The Last of the Mohicans, long thought to be an exaggerated account. If anything, it turns out it was an understatement. Studying these skeletons, we have found extensive evidence of this massacre, um, documenting the fact that atrocities were committed. Um, we know that there were mutilations and massacres on both sides. As part of this war, everyone was participating in this. This soldier was one that was beheaded, and we have the account of a French priest who saw the beginning of the massacre, describing one of the native allies of the French coming out of the casemates were the hospitals at the fort and carrying the head of his victim. Buried underneath the floor of the casemates, there was a mass grave of massacre victims, and this individual was indeed beheaded. In the neck bone that we have here, there are a number of cuts slicing across the bone and a final one all the way through the bone here across the top. And so we're fairly certain that this is the individual who was beheaded that the priest saw. The bones found inside the fort tell the story of the quick and ferocious attack. As part of the massacre, part of the picture we've been able to reconstruct is that there were mutilations on the body, and this included genital mutilations. There are cuts on the front of the pelvis um, in the area of the genitals. Um, in addition, we think some of the individuals were disemboweled, and there are cuts going all the way through the region of the stomach and abdomen into the backbone uh, behind the abdomen. And we have here a number of, of cut marks and damage to the bone from that incident. Today, forensic science reveals much about the hardships with which these young men lived, the horrors they suffered, and the savage ways in which many died. 
It can create a picture of a soldier who was over 18 and right-handed. A man who smoked a pipe, which he probably held in his left hand. A strong man who spent his days doing a lot of heavy lifting, his arms and legs free of arthritis, but his back in constant pain. His bones and those of his fallen comrades tell us much about what these soldiers' lives were like. But we can never know their names. Forever anonymous, they belong to the ages. In 1861, passions deeply felt over slavery brought the young American nation into a convulsive civil war. North against South, brother against brother, they fought for four bitter years. When the terrible trial by fire and sword came to an end, more than 600,000 boys and young men had died. The National Museum of Health and Medicine in Washington, D.C. was established in 1862 for record keeping and follow-up care of the wounded. Here, Paul Sledzik has studied more than 2,000 bones of Civil War casualties. Although bone may appear rock solid, in actuality, it changes over one's lifetime, even over the course of a few days, in response to exercise, wear and tear, and disease. Bone is like any other organ system in the body. It's constantly replenishing its cells and changing the, the cells within it. One of the changes that we can pick up in the bone that's interesting, um, because it gets at what activities that the soldiers were doing are these changes in the upper part of the humerus. This is the humerus or the upper arm bone from a Civil War soldier and this defect here, this etched area in the bone is indicative of heavy muscle activity of the upper arm, probably lifting the 15 to 20 pound rifles and firing them, digging with picks and, and axes. The bones also tell of the savagery of battle. Although the wire was added later, this piece of shot was lodged in this man's leg for perhaps two months before he died. These three cranial sections show very well how bone responds following trauma. This is, this is a skull section, an entrance wound going to the inner part of the skull. And if we look around the fracture margin, uh, there's no bony growth, and we know this man died as a result of this injury. This man lived for a month with this cranial injury. You can see there's some discoloration around the corners of the fracture margin here. If we look on the interior part of the skull, you also have some deposition of new bones called a periosteal reaction. You can see some of the gray uh, appearance here. This is a new bone that's being laid down uh, during the healing and or infection process. And then if we advance the time even further and go to a similar injury in the, in the cranium, this man lived for 10 years with this injury, a shot fracture injury. You can see there's been um, very good healing occurring around, around the site. Changes in the bones show the effects of one of the soldier's deadliest enemies, infection. This is the upper leg bone of Private Julius Fabre, who was wounded at Deep Bottom, Virginia, on the 16th of August in 1864. He was shot just above the knee, the knee would be here, and his limb was amputated uh, the following day on the 17th of August. He lived for six years with this, uh, with this uh, femur becoming infected. You can see the change that's occurred. Let me show you a normal femur for comparison. You can see the amount of infection that is set in on this bone. Later, Fabre required more extensive surgery as the infection spread toward his hip. For archival purposes, the museum routinely photographed amputees alongside their severed limbs. The first extensive medical encyclopedia on military casualties was made possible by these Civil War survivors. But it would take another major war before scientists could begin to put names to soldiers who had died. December 7, 1941. In the pre-dawn light, Japanese bombers appear out of nowhere.
sirens shriek, bombs explode. Pearl Harbor is destroyed. America is at war. Ironically, a war that took millions of lives would become the greatest boon to the fledgling science of forensic anthropology. World War II was the first war for which our service members had documented health records. By matching skeletal remains against known medical information, scientists were able to gather enough anatomical statistics to understand the life history each of us has written in our bones. During World War II and Korea, we had the first opportunity as a science to really look at some good documented modern samples and develop some new techniques for determining stature and age on, on these men uh, that were killed during the war. Since we knew who, who they were, they were positively identified, we could measure the length of a femur or a long bone and plug that into the stature regression formula or make new stature regression formula from that. Now, with a simple wooden board and a set of mathematical equations, anthropologists could begin to piece together profiles of the dead. This bone is 323 millimeters long, and if we plug that into our stature formula, our regression formula for stature, uh, we know this is a, a white male. Uh, we come up with an estimate of about 67 and a half inches, uh, plus or minus an inch on either side. That would be the stature estimate for this individual. But there are nearly 90,000 Americans from World War II, Korea, and Vietnam whose whereabouts are still unknown. Some of their remains have been recovered but not yet named. Other soldiers exist only as charred and shattered fragments hidden in remote jungles. But these men and women are far from forgotten. The search for their identity is one of the great detective stories in forensic science. More than two and a half million Americans served in the Vietnam War, the longest war in American history. 58,000 died at an average age of 19. Boys barely out of high school. The ferocious guerrilla combat mangled and mutilated bodies, often beyond recognition. The remains of over 2,100 of these young men never made it back to the United States. Many of the men were buried upon impact at crash sites in the jungles, or their bones lay undiscovered in the foliage, decomposing from the intense, moist, tropical heat. After nearly 20 years in the military, 38-year-old Air Force Major Edward M. Hudgens was preparing to retire when he was sent to Southeast Asia in 1969. At home in Big Spring, Texas, he left behind his wife, Mary, and their four children, Stacy, Wendy, Jeff, and Doug. On March 21st, 1970, seven months into his tour, Major Hudgens was leading a search and rescue mission flying over Laos when his A-1 aircraft was hit by intense enemy fire. Other pilots saw his plane go into an inverted spin and crash, but they saw no parachute and heard no emergency beeper signals. There was never any uncertainty as to uh, my husband's death. Uh, the uncertainty was not knowing when they were going to bring him back. All we could do was wait and wait for the government to get permission to go in. They were supposed to go into the site one time about two years ago, and we were all excited about it. And then um, there was a change in plans, and they could not go in. And I, uh, I was absolutely devastated. It just tore me apart, and I didn't realize how much I had counted on that. Mary Hudgens has never remarried. Using her VA benefits, she went back to school, got a job, and raised her four children alone. When other kids my age have lost a parent, they have a cemetery and a grave site they can go to and they can commune with their parent, their lost one. We didn't have that. Hope for the Hudgens family lies thousands of miles away where scientists they had never met worked to find Ed Hudgens and bring him home.
National Cemetery is known as the Punch Bowl. The stairs are flanked by stone walls etched with the names of thousands of soldiers who disappeared in combat, beginning with the Second World War. Nearby, at Hickam Air Force Base, the U.S. Army's Central Identification Laboratory, Hawaii, SEAL High for short, is one of the world's leading institutions in forensic science. The soldiers and civilians who work here have pledged that the unaccounted for are not to be forgotten. Currently, over 78,000 men and women are missing or unaccounted for from World War II. 8,100 from Korea, and 2,154 from the Vietnam War. Deputy Commander of SEAL High is retired Colonel Johnny Webb. Okay, as we prepare to go out to sites to recover service members lost in previous wars, a lot of work has to be accomplished before the teams can actually go out and begin the recovery operations. Plain metal shelves hold thousands of files. In each folder are the medical and dental records of soldiers missing from the Vietnam War. Today, much of the information has been transferred into a massive computer database. The real research is done in this room to prepare our teams to go out and do the excavations as well as to provide the information to the scientific staff to make the individual identifications. Before SEAL High sends an excavation team into the field, they study the reports from the casualty data section for each missing soldier. They then research any information gathered from outside sources. Eyewitness reports from local villagers who may have found a plane crash or people conducting oil or timber exploration can prove invaluable in pinpointing the exact location where a soldier was last seen. Seal High recovery teams train in Hawaii before excavations begin abroad. A mock demonstration site simulates an A6 series aircraft crash with meticulous detail. Uh, here we have a lot of pin flags, different colors, yellow designating wreckage, red designating unexploded ordnance or bombs, and the blue is designating any life support material, uh, things that the pilot was wearing at the time of the incident. A 12 by 16 meter area is laid out in 4 by 4 meter units so the team can document where each artifact is found. Dirt is carefully removed and brought to a sifting station where it is sorted by hand through a fine mesh screen. The smallest fragment might make the difference in finding a soldier's name. The team is looking for anything that can be identified, either from the aircraft or personnel, bones, ID tags, or pieces of a life support system. Metal detectors scour the site in hopes of finding scraps from the plane. In the field, the detectors are vitally important as they also help locate any live ammunition still on the site. Mostly coral, just this band of red. Ground penetrating radar sends radio waves into the earth which reflect off buried objects. Disturbance close to the surface. The surface profile has been disturbed recently. Okay, we have an anomaly. We have metal objects. Different types of materials create colored bands, 
which helps the team assess the likelihood of a burial. The first dramatic use is that when we go to Southeast Asia and we're and we have these witnesses to incidents that occurred in the 60s, these people are apt to be old. And what they do, they say, well, yes, I did bury him, I did bury the American, and I buried him somewhere around here, but it's changed. And then they might point to an area, it's a football field in size, you know? Maybe the body's there, maybe it isn't, but I can eliminate vast areas of it within minutes. After weeks and months of training, men and technology are put to the test in a once forbidden land. The jungles of Vietnam that claimed its victims more than two decades ago. The Army's Central Identification Laboratory sends teams all over the world to find the remains of service members who are missing or unaccounted for. Working in some of the world's most remote locations, the teams work tirelessly to ensure that they recover every piece of evidence. But two decades after the Vietnam War, crash sites are far from intact. Villagers have scavenged whatever they could find a use for. This piece of wreckage from a downed American airplane is being used as a blade for a plow. And now that plow may be hundreds of miles from where the plane actually went down. Seal High teams work closely with local villagers who might remember the crash or may have discovered some wreckage. The goal, to try to pinpoint the exact location of the crash. She said she, she saw 13 people. She personally counted 13 people uh, that morning. The team compares the information they receive from the villagers with detailed maps prepared at Seal High to determine the coordinates of the probable crash site. Global positioning systems fix their exact position as they trek sometimes for miles toward the site. Right dead on it, right in the middle of it. Once the excavation is set up, work begins to find and clear the area of any ammunition. The work requires patience right. and precision and can be extremely Good. dangerous. Beauty. Okay, move on back. Live 40 millimeter shells litter this C-130 crash site. Once they are located, they have to be carefully removed and carried to a safe distance where they will be disposed of later. Clues at the crash site come in different shapes and sizes. When a plane crashes, artifacts and remains bear the unmistakable scars of the 600 mile per hour impact. Large guns are buried by the force of the crash. The plane is literally torn apart. Pieces of the fuselage are scattered in all directions. It's a helmet, microphone assembly rack, the flyer's helmet. Deep in the jungle, another Seal High scouting team uncovers a button from a flight suit. Then, further digging reveals a remnant of fabric from the suit beneath the dense jungle foliage. In a high-tech war, soldiers are mangled by their machines. Finding an intact skeleton in Vietnam would be inconceivable. So every fragment is a vital clue. The most significant finds are human bones and teeth. All the remains found in Vietnam are brought back to the Seal High Laboratory in Hawaii for analysis. Sometimes, all the forensic scientists have to work with are mere fragments. 
from these, they must piece together whether they are human, and if so, the individual's age, race, height, weight, and ultimately, their name. To date, Seal High has positively identified 570 unaccounted for service members from World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, and returned the remains to their families. Often, bones arrive with no clear idea of where they came from. Identifying those remains is Seal High's most difficult task. Many times, several portions of a skeleton arrive at Seal High, each reported to be the remains of the same missing serviceman. Seal High anthropologists must try to identify each fragment of bone and determine who it belonged to. When bones cannot be identified by the standard methods, Seal High turns to DNA testing to analyze the remains. But the test won't work on small bone samples. I will tell you that this is the only bone fragment on the table that is large enough and in a good enough state of preservation, we think, to yield DNA. Before the bone can be tested, a sample must be cut and measured. Mitochondrial DNA will be extracted from the bone sample and compared to that of a living maternal relative. Okay. What do you think, five grams? Five grams. We're gonna send this sample to Aftil, and in about four weeks, they should issue a report to us on whether or not they were able, they were able to sequence mitochondrial DNA out of this sample. Before any work begins at the Armed Forces DNA Identification Laboratory outside Washington, D.C., the bone sample must be catalogued and photographed. In the laboratory, before the process of extracting its DNA can begin, the exterior surface of the bone sample is cleaned to remove any contaminants. Then, a two-gram fragment is washed, dried, and pulverized in a blender. The powder then undergoes a chemical reaction that disrupts the cells and releases the DNA into a liquid solution. This incubates overnight with an enzyme which breaks up the proteins within the cells, leaving purified DNA. Mitch Holland is the branch chief of service and genetic systems. Uh, DNA fingerprinting is just like a, a fingerprint. Uh, what we do is we look along the sequence of the DNA, we analyze those regions, uh, we compare those regions to, say, a suspect, a family member. When we do that comparison, we're looking for inclusions and exclusions. We're looking for matches and non-matches. Scientists at the Armed Forces Lab have a two-fold job, to identify DNA fingerprints from blood samples and the more complicated task of extracting DNA from remains which may be decades old. In order to match the DNA fingerprint of a missing soldier, the scientists must test it against a blood sample which has been mailed to the institute by a maternal relative. The process of extracting DNA from old skeletal remains is such a significant advance in biological science that in 1993, one of its creators, Dr. Carrie Mullis, earned a Nobel Prize. Scientists had known of DNA since the 19th century, but the mysterious nucleic acid structure was not known until the 20th century. In 1962, James Watson and Francis Crick won the Nobel Prize for uncovering DNA's three-dimensional molecular structure. There are two types of DNA. Nuclear DNA, which is found only in the cell's nucleus, and mitochondrial DNA, found in the surrounding mitochondria. The first type is not as plentiful as the second, which can endure in bones for thousands of years after death. In both varieties, DNA resembles a twisting ladder with cross rungs composed of adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, or A, T, G, and C for short. The prints in DNA fingerprinting are pieces of A, T, G, and C of varying lengths and arrangements. 
Mitochondrial DNA is inherited only from the mother. Therefore, people related along maternal lines share identical patterns in their A's, C's, G's, and T's that non-related people probably would not. A match indicates a high probability of identification, but in and of itself is not 100% conclusive. To have a large enough sample to work with, scientists are able to reproduce or copy the DNA in a machine called a thermocycler, which synthesizes millions of exact copies of the DNA within a few hours. The process is known as a polymerase chain reaction. The sample is then carefully loaded onto a gel through which an electric current is passed. Ultraviolet light helps visualize the individual bars of DNA. Then several samples are loaded onto what is known as a sequencing gel, one sample per lane. The sample is then read by a laser, which runs back and forth across it several hundred times a minute. The information is then converted into a peak, which can be translated into an A, G, T, or C. When compared to the family reference sample, if the sequences are identical, they are considered a probable match. Over the years, remains alleged to be those of Ed Hudgens came to Seal High four times. Once from an unknown source, once from a Laotian native, and twice from his known crash site. The bone tested for DNA was from the Laotian source and was clearly ruled out by the lab tests. But some of the bones acquired from the unknown source aligned with fragments from the crash site. These can be certified as belonging to Hudgens. Artifacts at the site found near Ed's remains included his watch, a buckle from his seat harness, a dog tag chain, and a dime. An American coin deep in a faraway jungle. But it would be a single tooth, not much bigger than the dime he carried in his pocket, which provided the pivotal clue the scientists sought. When the cases come into the Seal High laboratory, if there are dental remains, they are studied by forensic odontologists. They look for any unique characteristics which would help match the tooth to a missing soldier. In this tooth, we see a root canal. In other words, the tooth uh, had the insides removed and was filled with paste. Uh, and that matches very closely with what we see in the postmortem x-rays. Other fillings that are easy to match are these single fillings on the lower teeth, here and here, as well as this series of fillings on the upper teeth. And so this is a good example of when we have enough evidence to work with, both anti-mortem and post-mortem, about how closely we can match the dental records. Teeth are x-rayed, and the information is directly input into a huge database of dental records. This represents the post-mortem image that we just took on the tooth. All the dental records of people missing from Southeast Asia and Korea are kept on file. The forensic odontologist enters the specific details of the tooth that has been found into the computer begins to make a match by checking the tooth against the information in the records. This patient had fillings on a couple of teeth in the top right side. The computer checks the characteristics of this single tooth against the thousands of records in its memory. Each time it eliminates a record, it moves closer to finding a match. The forensic odontologist enters more information and the computer eliminates all but four records. This tooth could belong to one of four missing men. One more piece of information remains. This molar had a small filling in the bottom right quadrant. This information eliminates all the records but one. The team has made a match. 
Can you take this down to casualty data and tell them that we have a uh, pretty good hit on Cat Me and I'd like to take a look at the record? Yes, sir. Thanks. Only a few hundred bone fragments, most less than half an inch in size, and one tooth can be said with certainty to belong to Ed Hudgens. For the family, it is enough. Whether transporting tiny, unidentified bone fragments from an excavation site to a lab in Hawaii, or finally sending a soldier with a name home to his loved ones, Seal High treats all remains with utmost respect. Arlington National Cemetery, the ritual is repeated every hour, 365 days of the year. Fallen heroes forever honored, yet forever unnamed and unknown. But one hero, once among the missing, has finally been found. He comes to eternal rest with a name, full military honors, and a purple heart. For Mary Hudgens and her children, Ed Hudgens' journey cannot be measured in years nor calculated in miles. He lay in the jungle for 26 years, and we now have put him to rest and with honors, and his, his uh, fellow countrymen have honored him and it brings it to a conclusion for us. Twenty-six years to the day after Ed Hudgens' plane crashed in the jungles of Southeast Asia, his children lay a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknowns. Dozens of scientists around the world have worked toward this day. Piece by piece, clue by clue, they have unraveled a mystery that tormented a family for more than a quarter century. The final chapter in this soldier's story has been written. A family is reunited. An incomplete circle is, at long last, closed. Ed Hudgens has come home.